Well, hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. This episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast is sponsored by Trakel Art Supplies. If you love animals and love painting all that luscious fur, I want to let you know that Trakel Art Supplies is accepting submissions for their pet portrait competition. Submit your entry by August 31st, 2019. To get all the details on how to enter and what you might win, go to trakel.com. That's T-R-E-K-E-L-L dot com. This week on the podcast, I have Kathy Beeler, and I'm so excited to introduce you to her if you have not seen her work before. And if you have, you know you're in for a treat. Kathy is a longtime listener of the podcast, and she has taken several of my programs. She was in Mindset Mastery and Growth Studio, and I had the pleasure of meeting her in person a while back at some events, got to drink a glass of wine with her, and she is just wonderful. She's even recommended several of the guests that have been on the podcast. Kathy actually introduced me to Stanley Goldstein, who we talk about in this episode, and Studio gallery in San Francisco. So I got to have a great conversation with Jennifer Ferris about galleries and what artists should look out with. And I'm sure there's been a couple more that she has recommended over the years. Tim Horn, that was another interview that came from Kathy. So there have been a lot of great conversations on this podcast that you can attribute to Kathy Beeler. And now we get to talk to Kathy herself. So in this episode, Kathy talks about living on a boat and how she manages her painting, her storage, all that good stuff. She shares her palette with us. She talks about her process and we get into the nitty gritty. So this is a fabulous conversation with a wonderful artist who is a lifelong learner. Um, We talk about that as well. Kathy has taken many, many workshops and her work shows for it. She never stops learning. So I hope you enjoy this episode with the wonderful Kathy Beeler. Kathy Beeler, I am so excited to have you on the Savvy Painter podcast. This has been a long time coming. Welcome. Thanks so much, Antrice. I'm truly honored and um, kind of floored, actually, that I was invited in on the show. But yeah, I'm looking forward to talking with you. Right on. Tell me a little bit about the kind of work you do and how you started doing it. What made you decide to do this? The kind of work I do, I work mostly in acrylics and I work mostly on panel, but I started doing that kind of work, I guess, and to back up a little bit, the subject matter is kind of all over. I don't do any one subject matter for any length of time because I get bored. I started really focusing in on acrylic because my husband and I live on a boat and it was easy cleanup. I have an evaporation bucket outside. So I dump my dirty water in there and I let it evaporate. And then eventually I'll, I'll throw that bucket away. And I don't have to worry too much about, you know, with oil paint, it populates. You touch one thing, then it, another, and then pretty soon you have it all over the place. But with acrylic, for whatever reason, it feels a little bit more contained. And then I, I started using um, open goldens, which are an extended drying acrylic paint. And the reason why I use that, too, is because you can leave it on your palette. And I like for over a week, I can use the paint. What? I've never heard of this. Okay, we're going to definitely dive into that later. I didn't know that existed. Cool. Okay, keep going. Yeah. So that was the other reason why I've been doing Open Goldens. You know, to be fair, I haven't tried any other brand because it just works for me. And then, of course, you know, since being on the boat, I have painted a lot of reflective boat paintings And then there's a couple that come out and row every once in a while in their little green skiff, Phil and his wife, Janice. I've gotten to know them over time. And I've done like three or four paintings of them. And they've always sold. So that's been great. 
He hasn't asked for a commission yet, though. So <laughs> they're not asking for modeling <laughs> fees yet? Yeah, no, they're not. I give them a calendar every year because they're always featured in one of the months anyway. <laughs> I bet they love that. <laughs> very, very cool. So you are in the Bay Area in California, and you live on a boat. That sounds so romantic and so fun, is it? It has its uh, pros and cons. You know, when I'm at a friend's house, and I think I just immediately want to go look at their closet because there's like so much, oh, I wish I could just organize more. I mean, you have to keep things at a minimum on a boat, which is very hard to do because you always have to be sorting through things really and figuring out what you want in storage and what you want to throw away. There is some freedom in living in a minimalistic lifestyle, but there's also just the sense that, you know, items, material things can take over. Yeah, that environment makes this question so good because I, I hear this a lot. So can you share with us, this is a hot topic for me because I'm setting up my studio here in Argentina and you've seen those pictures. I saw that on Instagram. I was like so jealous. Oh my God, looks perfect. So clean. <laughs> yeah, because it's new. Just wait. <laughs> and it is in oils. I do paint in oils. So I do have that uh, spread that you were talking about. But tell me about how you manage your art supplies and all of that on a boat with such a small space. What do you do? Describe that for us. Okay, well, I have a shopping bag. And then in the shopping bag, are um, my coordinated colors that are also in a Ziploc bag. You know, I have like all of my worms in one bag, or, you know, I should say like yellows, orange, red, that's in one bag. Another bag, I have all of my greens and blues. And then in another bag, I have my earth colors. Yeah, so that's kind of how I do it. And then, so my husband's pretty tolerant of me. I can keep a tabletop easel up as long as I feel justified, as long as I'm working on something, it stays up. But if I go away for any length of time, I pretty much feel like everything has to come down, you know, so that he can just see the whole galley, you know, like have a sense of space for himself. But he's been pretty supportive. But anyway, um, and when I take that down, it just, I just find a place, cubby hole it somewhere downstairs, out of sight. <laughs> What do you do with all of your paintings? If there's an excess, which there hasn't been, because I also work. And as I go along, you know, most of the work that I've been doing has, you know, sold, fortunately, um, or I do commissions. Um, so there's not much that's around. But when there is stuff around, I take it over to my father-in-law's house. And there's a spare bedroom that I actually am using as a studio. But to be honest, you know, it takes a lot of effort on my part to go drive 30 minutes mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of just staying on the boat and working in acrylic. But usually if I have an oil painting that I want to work on, I'll go over to his house and work on oils there. Gotcha. And then, yes, so th there's excess supplies and storage of things that I, I leave over there. Interesting. Gotcha. Describe your process for us how you paint and how you use the different types of paint that you just described. This, this long drying acrylic, I will paint in anything, but I love oils. And so I have been sort of just focused on that. And that is the joy and the challenge of acrylics is that they dry so quickly. So tell me how that is, because I'm, I'm so curious, does it remove the sort of joy of the acrylics? If it takes that long to dry on the palette, does it also takes a long time to dry on the panel? So I do paint in layers because sometimes if you go over it, and especially if you go over it with a stiff brush, you have to kind of work in the synthetic, softer brushes, really, if you work on panel. But yeah, the process is that I would say I work in, in layers. And as far as the palette, I probably look like I have a million colors on my palette. And this... I got from studying with Stanley for a long time. And, That's Stanley and, you know, Goldstein. Stanley Goldstein, yeah. On my palette, I have a, a warm and a cool yellow. And then I have like a, okay, can never pronounce that special D yellow. You know which one I'm talking about. And I always want to call it dialeride. 
I don't know that yellow. So it looks like so I'm now I'm now on Golden Paints website and looking at diarylide yellow, <laughs> and it's a it is a transparent looking yellow. Is that correct? I think so. Okay. So along with that yellow that I can't pronounce, I have cad orange and cad red light, and then I have a, a magenta, and I do permanent maroon, and then ultramarine blue. Sometimes I use cobalt blue, phthalo blue, green and red shade, and then a um, phthalo green, sap green, and then burnt umber, burnt sienna, Indian yellow, yellow ochre, and Naples yellow. How's that? That's quite a palette. I know. And I have worked on limited palettes too, you know, like when I've taken workshops and stuff. But I find... The advantage of having so many colors is that you can go to the color faster as you want to mix it. I know there are some people who have limited palettes and they'll make their colors ahead of time, but I'm, I'm kind of lazy. Or efficient. Depends on how you (laughs) Thank you for reframing that. Thanks so much. (laughs) I think it's really, you know, for me, this is what I've found is that I love that I know how to mix any color out of pretty much anything, right? I think that's a really good skill to have because it the understanding of color that it gives you allows you to be more confident, I think, in your painting and what you're doing. And also, if you run out of a color, it doesn't matter. Having said that, I am all for shortcuts. Like if you don't have to <laughs> mix it, absolutely. <laughs> Anything you can do to make your life, your painting life easier. I will say this about mixing is that I still mix the color. Mm -hmm. So nothing is truly out of the tube, Mm -hmm. for the most part anyway. But since I've taken from Stanley, I'm going to quote him. And he says, whatever you're painting, name that color and desaturate it. Oh, interesting. And Yeah. And so that's the process that's in my head. Name that color and desaturate it. So it might mean that you're adding a little bit of you know, with a green, you might be adding a little bit of cad red light mm-hmm. um, or an orange, you know, something like that, where you're adding comments together. Yep. Yep. I can't think of anything that is that comes straight out of the tube unless at the very, very end of a painting, like I really need to get that white because I usually hold the white out. And that's the only color that I can think of that I will just grab it right out of the tube and slap it on the canvas. Well, in terms of white... Even um, when I first started with Stanley, he said that about my paintings. He said, yeah, you use too much white. It was like white's the enemy. So I've learned that to make whites look more luminous or to make it look maybe perhaps not so stark is to add, if there's something that's really white in a painting, you know, mix it with a little bit of yellow, just a little bit of yellow. Mm -hmm. This is where I'm like, I'm just going to go with whatever question I have. (laughs) So (laughs) what I found really interesting about whites is just, or about anything is just constantly comparing everything that's on the canvas and deciding also. It's a comparison. It's an observation. One thing like I should note, because we did talk about what you paint, but to like back it up even further, Kathy is a representational painter. And you paint, from what I've seen, you paint scenes, you paint still lifes, you paint landscapes, whatever's around you. But within all those categories, it is all bets are off, whatever attracts our attention. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. (laughs) And so with that, what I'm thinking about is just the idea of, you know, we're out there painting and you see a white building And the question I'm at least always asking myself is, it's white compared to what? And looking around the painting and trying to figure out like, okay, where is the brightest point that I see? But also, where do I want to put the brightest point in my composition, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. And adding a little touch of yellow to it sometimes I think is exactly what it needs. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it is kind of amazing, you know, like how colors interact with each other and how they relate to each other. And putting one color next to another color, you know, will change its delivery, so to speak. Mm-hmm. You know, its presence. 
So I think exactly what you're saying about everything is relative. Like if you put something on canvas, if it's too overblown, too whitish or too overexposed because you're working from a photograph, which I often do, then you have nowhere to go with it too. So you have, you know, you have to kind of keep all those things in mind as well. If that makes any sense. It does. I'm curious how you interpreted that comment. White is the enemy. Uh, for those of you listening, I have, I interviewed uh, Stanley a long time ago. Oh my gosh. Like, I feel like it was the first year of the podcast. Um, so if you're interested in hearing that, you can look that up on the podcast. But I'm going to make an assumption that that conversation came up because your paintings maybe felt chalky. Was that the genesis of it? Yeah, I do think they looked chalky too. You know, now that I look back on some of those paintings, I mean, I, I sort of brought them in like, these are the best because he wanted to see samples of my work. And so I brought them in thinking like he's going to think that I'm, you know, I'm skilled. That was exactly not what he said. <laughs> what? <laughs> but that was great. It's all part of the learning process, too. And I, I know that what he's saying is true. And so I do, I do strive. I don't know. I'm not always successful, but I do strive to keep those whites or whatever, you know, to a, a minimum and also to make things sing as much as I can make them sing. That's a question I hear often about people. And, you know, sometimes they, they just know sort of, I guess it's kind of like you just know the symptom, but you don't really know the cause of it. So they'll say things like, oh my gosh, my painting looks so chalky. And so that's why I want to dig into this a little bit, because I know people will like that statement is perks people's ears up. Are you able to sort of articulate like how your painting changed from then until now? Because it certainly does not have a chalky feel to it. And so I'm wondering if aside, so being aware of the whites, but also were there other conscious choices that you have made that have changed the way that you either look at color or apply it to your canvas after that conversation? I mean, I think the colors come as I mix them. And sometimes I think it's intuitive. Color also plays an integral role with value, too. You know, like your values are very important. They always say, you know, color gets all the credit and value does all the work. And so I think that you have to kind of keep that in mind, too, as you mix the colors to keep the value in mind as well. And in terms of progression in my painting, I would say that the colors that I'm using are just what Stanley says, name that color and desaturate it. And at, in the process, you know, when you neutralize things, you can always pump things up too. You sort of have your supporting actors help with the star. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting way of putting it. So it's funny because so much of how we see work and who we are as artists come from the people that we learn from and, of course, our own experiences. And I tend to be such a sort of rebel-ish slash intuitive painter that anytime anyone says, okay, you automatically do this, I'm all, I kind of sit up in my seat and I'm like... I don't know about that. <laughs> you know, I think that I think it's nobody so funny. can peg me. <laughs> so at first, when you said that, I was like, I don't know, that sounds like, you know, in my head, it's just so funny to catch yourself thinking things. So it's funny for me to just like, say, uh, like, identify it and say it out loud. Like when you said that, I was like, huh, sounds like a rule. And it could turn into a crutch. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> But I think behind it, the intent of it, the genius of it, it's the same thing that we all do, right? Or that, you know, that is such a big part of painting. And what you learned from Stanley, what you do in your paintings is you are doing with color and saturation, exactly what we just talked about with the whites, where you're kind of holding back a little bit so that by desaturating it right off the bat, so that you can allow yourself to put that spot, put that note center stage and allow that one place or that one object to have full saturation. Yeah. You know what, thinking of Stanley, I also just want to add in there that throughout time, I mean, for a long time now, you know, I've been trying to be a serious painter, 
even though I, I work as a social worker. But in my off time, I'm pretty obsessed. But I will say that I've been studying not only with Stanley, but also with Peggy Crowell Roberts. I think that she actually helped me also with my work in terms of understanding design and um, understanding, you know, like how things are in shadow and how things are in light. So she's a wonderful teacher as well, if anyone has the opportunity. I've been studying with her since 2006. Oh, wow. At least once a year, at least once a year. Peggy is outstanding. And yeah, she's another one for sure. For those of you listening, if you have, if you don't know who Peggy Kroll Roberts is, you absolutely should look her up. And oh my gosh, she's another person that I interviewed on the podcast early on. So both of them, you can hear them talk about their work. I'm realizing I'm going off on a tangent, but the things that I do admire about Peggy is that she's never stopped learning, even though I, she's quite accomplished. She's always seeking more and more knowledge. And to me, that's just like, God, what a role model. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so, yeah, I think it's so important if you, like, I would consider Peggy to be someone who is extremely skillful, extremely well-versed in painting. I know people don't like to be called masters, but I would put her kind of her abilities. Uh, she's up there. She's yeah. she's definitely up there. <laughs> she's up there. <laughs> and here's the thing is the way that you get up there is to, and I would describe you the same way, is that you know that you always have something to learn and you are constantly, uh, what popped into my head is sharpening the ax. <laughs> like I'm thinking of, <laughs> of Abraham Lincoln quote for some reason, which out of context sounds just terrifying. It's okay. I'm picturing myself chopping wood now. Painting. <laughs> <laughs> but you're constantly honing your, that's why there was that long pause as I was talking. I was like, oh, oh, I don't think I like that visual. You're constantly honing your skills and you're constantly looking at every little bit, not saying, oh, I've done that, but how can I make this better? And how can I increase my skill level, which I don't think anyone in their entire life, no matter how long they've been painting, can um, stop doing that. I think that's what makes great artists. It really is the fuel that keeps you going, you know, just wanting to be a better painter. And I've been asked in the past, like, don't you feel sad when you sell a painting or you're, you know, it goes away from you. And I have to say, I never feel sad because I always feel like the next painting I'm going to do is going to be better. I always have that sense. And I actually don't like keeping them around because the more I keep them around and I look at them, the more I see, Hmm. Yeah. I could have done better on that. And, you know, I mean, it's sort of like overthinking things. So I'm happy that they get adopted. I love that. (laughs) So if you heard the last episode of the Savvy Painter podcast, I answered your questions about art competitions. And Kathy was one of the people who asked a question. So I had her answer her own question. But before we get into that, coincidentally, I swear the planets just line up like this. I found out about a competition with Trakel Art Supplies. So I want to take a minute here to put this one on your radar because I think it's going to be a really fun one. One of the concerns a lot of artists mention is the price to enter a competition. Well, here's one that will fit just about anyone's budget. From now until midnight, August 31st, 2019, Trakel Art Supplies is running a pet portrait competition. And to enter... All you need to do is purchase one of their official pet portrait panels and create your entry on it. And to make it even easier on your wallet, Trakel is giving you a discount on your panels. They're only $9.99 plus shipping and handling. Jennifer Gennari will be judging the entries in four separate categories, advanced, intermediate, beginner, and And I love this part so much. There is a special category for kids under 12. This is a competition everyone can enjoy. So if you love your fur babies and you want a chance to win a $1,000 gift certificate from Trakel, head on over to Trakel.com and check this competition out. And one more time, that's T-R-E-K-E-L-L.com. 
So speaking of your paintings getting adopted, I am sure I just have this intuition. I just know these things that 90% of the people listening are thinking, wait a minute, she lives on a boat and she doesn't have storage problems. How is that? Oh, she sells her paintings. She can't keep them. How did you do that? Like, let's talk about that piece of it. For you, what has been the most surprising habit that allows you to send all your babies out for adoption so quickly? I don't know that it happens so quickly, but I really think it has to do with just keeping up with painting. Just keep painting. Out of all the people that I've ever taken from, they all say the same thing. You know, to get better is you just have to paint all the time or as much as you can. And I think over time, because certainly it wasn't true in the very beginning when I took when I was taking my art very seriously, I had a lot to learn and I still have a lot to learn. But in the beginning, things did not disappear or get adopted as, you know, I would have liked. But it started off kind of slow. And the way it started off was that, you know, I entered art league shows. And from there, I began uh, selling paintings on the Internet through those means. And that's a website where it's kind of like an eBay for paintings because they get auctioned. And then since that, I've just gone on to have my work in galleries. And every once in a while, I have something posted on Daily Paintworks, but not very often anymore. So I don't know. Did I answer that question or did I go off the rails here? No, you did not go off the rails. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> All right. So I think working, you know, painting, getting better, having exposure on the internet. And, you know, I did a blog for a while. I've been very neglectful on the blog. And then having a website, having a Facebook page, having Instagram, and just sharing the work has brought in people. And, you know, I just have my, I guess I have my toes and fingers into not only the internet, but just, you know, brick and mortar galleries too. I'm a a participant with Studio Gallery in the city. And I just got invited into Nancy Dodds in Carmel. Woohoo! And then I participate and, and have been a participant for a long time at the Valley Art Gallery in Walnut Creek. Yeah, so I think that that exposure has been part of the reason why I don't have as many paintings hanging around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you get your work out. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's an active strategy, I guess. You take an active role in it. So you mentioned that it was a slow start. And yes, it's always a slow start, right, with everything. So you're building up both your chops and people are also starting to follow you and realize like, oh yeah, she's, it's not just she's serious and she's consistent about it. It's, I think that's part of the thought that happens, but also when you are putting the painting first and putting your learning first and putting the time in, then people can't help but notice the improvements. And also it's exciting to watch somebody grow and develop and see them to sort of blossom as an artist. Yeah, I'm st- I feel like I'm still emerging, you know, and that, you know, I have so far down the line to learn things and, and get better, but I have been taught by so many good people. And um, I just want to bring in Tim Horn as well. He's another person who is also a master of design and landscape painting, and he's known for his Airstream paintings. So, All of those teachers that I've had that I've taken over the years have been very encouraging to me. You know, when you have support, me, that's part of the ingredient for success. When you have people who say to you, just keep going, you know, keep painting, then you feel like you have more confidence and that there's something there. You know, there's something there to mold and to evolve with. If you can think back to that time when you were in that sort of slow, very slow start phase that you mentioned, 
I'm curious, like what you just said about um, having people who support you and having the confidence to move on. I'm kind of curious, like what were you feeling during that time? And let's just start there. Like, so during that time when, when it was just kind of like, I really want to do this and I'm really trying to learn and I'm squeezing it in between my job and I live on a boat. You had lots of reasons to slip off the radar, let's say, or to (laughs) kind of like hang up the brushes for a while. Did that ever occur to you? Or can you describe that? Well, so hanging up the brushes actually had occurred long before that time. You know, I had started off thinking I was going to go into art school. And then I got chicken. And I decided to get a degree in sociology and then go on to get my degree in social work. And I kind of put art way to the side. And then I'm not sure. I've always taken art lessons here and there just to kind of keep my toes in the water a little bit. But I I think I began studying with an artist who was was very encouraging. And I actually entered a a painting in an art show that won second prize. And I was very surprised by that. But in terms of just getting started and, and the feelings back then, I think I was feeling overwhelmed you know, with how much I felt like I needed to learn. And then you go back and forth thinking like, because you get feedback from family who don't tell you the truth or friends for that matter, you know, and I, I, I know they're that. Telling I know you, I'm going <laughs> to, I think they're telling you their truth. Their eyes are very fogged up by how much they love you. Their truth is now they say to me, oh, Kathy, your work is, you know, amazingly better <laughs> than it was. But you said it was great back then, you know, so (laughs) they were being nice. But you know what? Those words actually did help me keep on going. I think what they're trying to say is that they see me having the growth. So I take it as a compliment. I would guess that especially for people who, for artists whose families may not have an art background or whose friends may not have an art background, as you are progressing and your skills are increasing, their ability to discern, you know, like, let's say good art versus like art that needs improvement is growing with you. And so they don't even know, like, it's really interesting. There is, I think, a distinction with people who see art and who have not tried to make it themselves and who have no art background. I think those two things are very important, most important, trying to make it yourself because then you really understand how difficult it is. They don't have the vocabulary to really say what they're thinking, the visual vocabulary, I mean, to be able to say like, I know my brain is telling me like, it's, I see what it is and I like it. It's pleasing. I love the colors. I love this. So there are things that they can name. And then there's other things that they don't, it's like a low level. They're not really sure there's something off, but they couldn't possibly identify it. Um, So they focus on what's good. And then you show, as your skills improve, you show them Well, there's actually like 50,000 shades of green and using the right one matters. (laughs) (laughs) And they're like, whoa, that's amazing. Yeah, that was probably a really good summary of that whole process. Yeah. So let's circle back then. So, you know, at that time, though, there's an immense amount of faith that as artists, we need to have that. I'm sticking with this. I'm following through. So you had the support of your friends and family who helped you keep going and and keep the confidence up. Was there anything else that you developed or you realized as you were going through that? And the reason that I'm asking this is because, you know, a lot of times when I ask these questions, it's because I know how many people out there are in that place right now and they're just thinking like, this is frustrating and exhausting and I don't know if I can do this. I think at the time, asking myself what it was that I wanted to do with my art. Was it to you know sell work? Was it to um, have something just for myself? Was it just being in the, in the moment, in the process of enjoying it? So I think I had to kind of start with being in the process of enjoying it. You know, it wasn't meant for anyone else to see necessarily, and that it was just for me. 
And, you know, it was all about trying to get better and then picking up the tools as you go along, you know, like if you're drawing something, you know, if you look at it in a mirror, does it hold up? Or if you look at it upside down, does it help you paint in a different way so that it, it makes just things like that, that I learned along the way were helpful. But yeah, I think that the expectations is part of what the struggle can be. You know, if you have an expectation that you're going to sell your work right away, here's another one. If you put your painting into an art show and it gets an award, does that mean that every time I put a painting in an art show, it's going to get an award? No, it does not. <laughs> Aha, that's interesting. Yeah. So you, I mean, it's not like, you know, like go to um, Vegas where you win a thousand dollars because you put a, all that money into a slot machine. Does that mean that every time you put money in a slot machine, you're going to win a thousand dollars? No, it does not. So it's all risk and gamble. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the payoffs. Yeah, I think it's all about expectations of yourself. And I think for myself anyway, I still am learning it is try not to be hard on yourself and don't make it such a punitive thing that you don't enjoy it. I certainly get frustrated with paintings and I just put them to the side. Like you're totally irritating me. I'm putting you to the side. I'm going on to something else. And then I'll go back to it. I'm going to embarrass you right now just because I have to. Kathy, okay. I have to tell you how proud I am, how far you've come in talking about your work. You are blowing my <laughs> mind right now because you did not want to talk about your work at all before. I love it. It makes me so happy. Well, thanks. I was taught by somebody named Antrice Wood to be able to talk about myself as an artist and to call myself an artist. Yeah. Oh, that's right. You didn't want even want to call yourself an artist. Yeah. And taking a sip of tea just on your behalf here. Yeah. <laughs> another question I know a lot of people have. You have another career. You have a job that you work at and you, again, you live on a boat and you find time to paint. So for people out there who have full-time jobs and struggle to find time to paint and fit it in and get really frustrated because they have to go to work for eight hours a day and they would really prefer to just be painting, what would you say to them? What advice do you have? So I think for me, the way it works is that being able to have a job supplies me with benefits and the benefits of not only just, you know, health care and vacation time and all those things, they provide security, but the benefit of being able to work with people to be out there. And I find that for myself, having a, a full time job doing what I do, which is medical social work, I get engaged with those conversations with people, it allows me to connect. It allows me to, you know, even take breaks away from art. And so when I come back to it, I'm more appreciative of the work. I guess I really value the time that I do have to paint. So when I'm working on, say, a deadline or something, if I have an hour or two in the morning before I go to work, I'll work on something before I go. And maybe I don't feel like it, but I'll just say, okay, just try to do it for 15 minutes. Because in 15 minutes, pretty soon it's like a half hour or an hour. But then you have to kind of cut yourself off so you can get ready and go. But it does make me appreciate my time with my art. And then the week. And then I just paint during the daytime, you know, when there's daylight. Because the light on the boat is not really great when it's dark. And then I try to make time for my husband in the evening. I bet he appreciates that. We finished watching Game of Thrones, so that was quite an accomplishment. <laughs> oh my gosh, that. Oh, I'm so having withdrawals. Yes. Same thing with my husband. Exactly the same. It's so funny. Kathy, you posted something on Instagram. Actually, I you don't know this yet, but I did answer your question. It's just you're not going to hear it till tomorrow when tomorrow's podcast episode comes out. <laughs> 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 we're, we're bouncing back and forth between the future and the past in these weird time jumps. So you were asking questions about competitions, about art competitions. And 
I'm going to flip that back to you. So I answered your question. You get to hear it tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Everybody else who's listening to this has probably already heard it. So there's so such weird time warping happening right now. But it, I think it's good because you it's I'm going to get the fresh Kathy perspective without the Antries influence. Since competitions have played a role in your work, I would love to hear your take on competitions. When do you decide that you're going to enter one? What is your process? I'm trying so hard not to ask leading questions. What is your process <laughs> for entering a competition? First of all, I, I don't enter very many. And um, I try to be selective on the ones that I do enter. I look at I look at the type of work that they're asking for. Also, if I can look in previous competitions to see what kind of work has been accepted in. And then I, I measure, like, do I have enough caliber to kind of measure up to that work? Or is it, you know, at a different skill level? Whatever it is. But I, I judge my work according to what I see and see whether or not it can be whether or not I have the confidence to enter. So that's part of it. And then I certainly look at the entry fee, like how much is that going to be? And um, I don't ever count on getting an award, but sometimes, you know, like, like let's say it's a big award, like it's a $5,000 award, then you know it's going to draw in the, the most competitive of artists, you know, who are their skill level is just like, you know, they blow me away. So I keep that in mind as well. And I guess just, you know, whether it's local or national, I don't think I've ever considered international, but I, I look at, you know, like how far spreading it is. So those are the things that I take a look at and whether or not I have a good image of a painting to submit. Because photographing your work, sometimes it requires more than your iPhone. Yes, <laughs> it's frustrating <laughs> when that happens. <laughs> oh, and the other thing I'll say too, is that I look at who's judging the show. And honestly, this is a rule that I have, and nobody has to have it, but the rule that I have is that if I know the judge, I don't enter. It's just because I don't know if I would feel totally let down if I didn't get selected, or if I did get selected, would somebody know I knew that person and somehow it would be a conflict. So I just avoid the whole thing. And I never enter a contest or a competition where I know the judge. Interesting. I'm smiling. I'm laughing because what I'm thinking right now is, wow, Kathy, you take so many workshops and you put yourself out there <laughs> so much that pretty soon you're not going to be able to join any competition anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say I took a workshop recently with Sarah Sedwick, who's, by the way, she's fantastic. And she does a great painting lessons. And those exercises were fun. You know, she mentioned people coming in and who were workshop junkies. And um, I guess I would classify myself as that. But I also, I'd also like to reframe that because I feel like the workshops that I take, they're artists that attract me. I'm attracted to their work. There's something about their work that speaks to me that I want to understand. And I feel like, you know, I never went to art school, but there's a series of painting lessons that I've gotten all along the way since taking this seriously since 2006, that it's part of an education. It's not just being a workshop junkie, but it's getting an education in my painting. Mm -hmm. And I think it also matters what your definition of a workshop junkie is. I think she meant nothing but good by it. Yeah. I know. yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sure she wasn't. She wasn't <laughs> saying that in a derogatory form, but I mean, I think that the term workshop junkie, it's sort of like a, you know, it's we're teasing each other in the same way that I think a Sunday painter started out, but Sunday painter is now turned into somewhat derogatory. But I think a you know, workshop junkie to me is a person who is just loves learning and who is just going to, I mean, I, I would be in workshops every single weekend if I could. <laughs> me too. If I could afford it. Yeah. And yeah. If I could afford to travel everywhere I wanted to go. And yeah, if money were no object and I had and I, you know, well, if money's no object, then I guess time becomes a little bit more 
bendy, but I would be in a workshop every single week and I don't think I would ever get tired of it, which means that to me is a workshop junkie because you just can never get enough. <laughs> I, I think the only time that it becomes really damage or damaging, I don't know if that's probably too strong of a word, but I think when if people are using it to sort of buffer their feeling that they're not good enough and they just keep, you know, that they're, that they're constantly, it's subtle, but I think there's a huge distinction between wanting to improve yourself versus I'm not good enough. I have to learn more. Like one comes from almost a sense of abundance while the other one comes from more of a scarcity, lack of not enough of mentality. And if you're in that not enough thought process, then nothing is ever enough, ever. It doesn't matter how many workshops you take. It's never going to be enough. And it's not from a good place. And I think you can become overwhelmed by it. That sometimes you can get all the rules and everyone says them differently or they emphasize one thing over the other. And then you can become confused by that. But if you kind of learn the basic rules and then you incorporate them for yourself and then you, I think if you pick people that there is something about what they do, like if I wanted to learn edges, for example, who would I pick to take from? If I wanted to learn value, who would I, who would I take from? So those are the kinds of questions that I think are important, you know, when you are doing workshops is, um, you know, or paint quality all of those things. There's so many things. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that this is a a little bit of a a right turn, but you mentioned that you started painting, I think you said seriously in 2006. Was there something that happened in 2006 that made you kind of buckle down? Or was it just, it was time? I think it was just time. I would say that in 2008, My husband was involved in a pretty serious uh, paragliding accident, which left him disabled. He can walk around and stuff, but he deals with all kinds of chronic pain and uh, a bunch of other things. But in the process where he was, you know, close to death, I sat with him at the hospital for like a month or two, just sitting there doing this pointillism picture I did with Sharpies and a canvas board of a house in a nearby town. And I I just did that the whole time I was sitting with him. And I was thinking about my art at the same time. And I think that going through a very serious time makes you consider all things in life. And I think the question for myself was, how do I want my life to be? And how, you know, how serious do I want to take this? And certainly, I'm there for my husband and but what is it that I also want to do in this short lifespan? Mm -hmm. I love that. It's beautiful. Yeah. Priorities. And like I said, you know, he's been wonderful and supportive and he puts up with all my crap on the boat. (laughs) (laughs) He's a keeper. He is for sure. Is there anything else that I haven't asked you that you feel like, people should hear. Any advice that you would give to new painters, somebody who has kind of come back to painting after a while, or acrylic painters, or (laughs) (laughs) people who live in small spaces? (laughs) Well, I think one of the things that comes to my mind in terms of passing on any wisdom is that I'm still learning this, but it's it's how not to be so hard on yourself. And, you know, art is a process and we're all going to get better. Just keep doing it. We're all going to get better. And remember that competition is not necessarily competition with others, but looking in the mirror, that's your competition. Like every time I do a painting, I want to do better than the last painting I did. And if I can do that, then I feel like I'm succeeding. If I start to compare myself to other people, which sometimes can't be helped, but comparing myself to other people doesn't help me. It detracts me. And sometimes it can make me feel worse. So I would say that is to keep that in mind. And like wherever you're starting at, 
you know, if you think about this, if you stopped drawing or painting, and I've heard this, and I'm not sure if it was on your show, but if you stopped drawing or painting when you were in the sixth grade, when you pick it back up, you're going to be that sixth grader. That's where your starting point is. And so just allow it to be there and just know that it's normal for what you have in your mind will not necessarily come out in the paintbrush. That's okay. But you're still striving to get there. Kathy, I want to dive through the screen and give you a big hug. That was an amazing conversation. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) I always enjoy talking to you, but I especially love this one because I get to share Kathy with everybody else. Thank you so much for doing this with me. (laughs) Oh, thank you, Entries. It was really a pleasure. Oh my gosh. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Kathy Beeler as much as I did. If you want to see Kathy's work, get links to any of the artists we talked about, all you have to do is go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the podcast link. You'll see examples of Kathy's work, and I will put links to all the interviews with the artists that we talked about. There was an interview with Stanley Goldstein you might want to listen to, and Peggy Kroll Roberts. Those are two artists that we talked about that I've interviewed on this podcast. You'll also get links to connect with Kathy. She has a wonderful Instagram feed, so you should definitely do that. And while you're there, if you haven't already signed up for the Savvy Painter email list, get on it. What are you waiting for? There are some exciting things coming soon. In July, you'll see some changes and you'll get to learn about those first on the email list. Have a great week, everybody. Talk soon. So until the next time, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.